Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Welcome to episode 267 of the Team House. I'm Jack Murphy here with Dave Park, and we're very honored tonight to have on our show as a guest, retired Command Master Chief Herschel Davis, served in the UDT SEAL teams, uh, had a very extensive career, uh, and then retired and, and had a, another second career uh, as a, a security contractor working abroad. Um, Herschel, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Really appreciate you coming on here tonight. My pleasure. <laughs> so you're uh, you're lucky. You're the, the first ones to ever get me to do anything <laughs> like this. <laughs> well, and I, I appreciate you bearing with us and through all the technical issues. And our viewers can see Herschel's on the phone. It's a bit of a jury rigged situation, but um, it seems to have worked out. Um, so Her Herschel, my, my first question, I just want to ask you if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, how you grew up, what your upbringing was like and how that sort of propelled you towards military service. Well, a lot of military people in my background, my mother was the baby of 12. So everybody was old when Herschel came along and I went by Benny back in those days uh, until I joined the Navy and. Then everybody started calling me Herschel, except close friends. But uh, that's that's as I grew up, I military is all I wanted to do. Of course, I started out with slingshots. Then my dad got me as a, a single shot little rifle, and I started shooting things, and we ate them. So that uh, that dad of mine was the only man I've ever been afraid of. God, <laughs> mind, he was scary. He was he was a tough old boy. He was a cracker from Georgia. Tougher than shoe leather, old fighter, college educated, and uh, they raised me quite well, I thought. Mom was very loving, dad was scary, <laughs> and usually mom would save me. Marvin, that's enough. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Can you just stay with me, mom? <laughs> but I'd wild in a march hair, I'd do any damn thing, but, you know. Not necessarily right, but that's the way it was. When you're a kid, you don't think about shit. You just yeah, yeah. do it. And so as you came of age, you, uh, you know, 17, 18 years old, how does the Navy start to enter into the picture? Well, I had uh, I had a cousin who was a sailor guy, uh, Korea. I had several that were back in World War II. My dad's brother was with the Army, and... Uh, he was he was a terror too. I guess they just growing up on that plantation. They just became terrors. But uh, Uncle Wayne, of course, he's passed away. But uh, God, he had some down in Papua New Guinea and Philippines. He was with MacArthur out of Australia, and uh, God, he was on and sin. He made it up to the rank of captain and retired at second class. <laughs> <laughs> So he was he was always knocking the shit out of somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so you uh, you enter into the Navy and uh, looking over your uh, your 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 CV, your resume, service record, I saw that you actually started out your career. You were you were a sub guy. Yeah, I came in as a nuke. I, I had a I was pretty yeah. Well, I, I I don't want to brag, but I was smart. I had good grades in high school and everything, and I had a scholarship to college. And my senator that had me appointed, uh, I was first alternate, so I'd have probably got in, but he died, and it just all went down the swirly. Oh, wow. And uh, and I wanted to be a naval officer, but uh, that didn't work out. So my option was to join the Navy. And the test, I aced the test that they gave me, and the Corzetti, Chief Corzetti, I'll never forget him. He said, uh, you can do anything in the Navy you want to do. What do you want to do? I want to be on one of them damn submarines. How about the nuclear program? About two and a half years of training, and you have to join the Navy for six. I said, hell, I'll join the Navy for 20 if you want me to. But <laughs> I joined the Navy, Navy for six, and uh, 
two and a half years of school, nuke school, all that stuff, sub school, blah, 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 all down the line. And that's how it worked out. Then I uh, took a test somewhere while I was on my first submarine, which I was just getting qualified. It was a diesel boat. And I was uh, in the engine room, after engine room, boiler. And uh, I got approached to, uh, you know, if you want to be an officer, we got this uh, NISEP program, Naval Enlisted Scientific Education Program. And I said, well, I'll give it a try. But I wanted to be a Naval Academy officer. You know, you don't ask me why. I don't know. It's just the way I was. And if you're going to start, start at the top. And, and you know, I got to college. I got it selected. And I was spent four years at the University of Missouri in my last semester. And you know what? I hate to pay, pass the blame. It, it's my fault. But I had the sorriest damn professor I ever had while I was in school in Mizzou. Mm-hmm. And uh, I failed advanced thermodynamics. I smoked the first one, but that second one, I need a little help, and he couldn't help me. Well, read. Read the damn book. I've read the damn book a half dozen times. I need your help. You're the professor. And he didn't give it to me, and then he he didn't like me because he knew I didn't like him. But uh, that's the way it worked out, so I just went back to submarines, and all of a sudden, I wanted to be a frogman. And, uh, I secretly took the test because they would not recommend me to take it. And Dow Byers, a senior chief out of Team 21, was administering all the tests. He came to Key West. and I ran. I swam. I did the PT and all that stuff, passed it all. And I said, I'm not supposed to do this. They would not recommend you. He said, I don't give a shit what they do. I can take you. Now, you want to come? Yeah. So orders showed up, and the XO told me to get off, get off the ship. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I went to frogman training in Little Creek, Virginia. 148 men in my class, 19 of us graduated. Wow. And tell us, what, what, year, what, year, what year was that, Herschel, and what were the UDTs like at that time? 1966. They were great. They were absolutely great. You know, old school shit is where I'm at. <laughs> Everything worked just fine. We cruised the world. I was on board ship. We went everywhere. And then uh, Vietnam started. You know, I was I was wanting to go to SEAL team. Mm-hmm. But there, I was three and a half years there. I was a leading petty officer in a platoon. And they wouldn't recommend me. No, we need you here. Well, it was coming up time for me to get out. So I said, fuck it. I'm just going to get. Oh, excuse me. I'm just going to get out. If they won't let me go to the SEAL team, I'm just going to get out. I've done everything I can do here in the UDTs. And uh, they came over. My buddy was, I went through training with, old Roy Dean Matthews come over and said, if you ship over for SEAL team, you can come come over. We need you in the platoon. We're getting ready to go to Vietnam. I said, I'm in. So I shipped over and went to SEAL team. Went to Vietnam, got my ass shot off, and I was in Japan, getting repaired, and uh, once I got functional, I, uh, my doctor, Dr. Bud, I said, uh, I'd like to go back to Vietnam, my platoon. Well, we don't have any way to send you back. The land bridge is just the United States. They'll send you back if they want you, if they want to. I said, I don't work for me, Doc. I'm going back to Vietnam. If you won't fly me back, I'm going to get back. And uh, one of the guys in there, I've tracked him down. I tried to track him down for about 10 years, but he probably died. He was a Marine. Him and I were in the, or the comfort room together. You Kind of an in-dock room is where you hang out when you first get there. And uh, somebody gave me, he gave me 20 bucks because I didn't have no money. Had no clothes, nothing, just in a gown with the back end out. And uh, two Marines, one gave me a pair of pants, one gave me a, a jumper, had no ID card, had a little green ditty bag from the Red Cross. And I had no shoes, couldn't find no boots. So I went in those little sponge rubber slippers they gave me and 
Went out to Atsugi, Japan. There's two Marines there getting ready to fly somewhere down in southern Japan. I asked they'd take me, told them who I was, where I wanted to get. They put me on board, flew me down there. I was just across the water from Okinawa. Two Marines were going to their plane as we got out and we were going into ops. They said, hey, take this, take this swabby, and he wants to get back to Vietnam. And, of course, Doc, oh, and I got back. It took me 20 hours to get home. And I promised the doc I wouldn't go out on any ops for 30 days because I was still healing. I went out that night with, with the platoon. <laughs> we killed 26, captured 13. We killed them too, but we talked to them first. That's just the way it was with us. We didn't take prisoners. And, uh, of course, they wouldn't have taken us either probably if they'd have got after us. But that's my story, and that's how it got going in. Herschel, I could was, uh, and, could could we back up a little bit and tell us about like landing in Vietnam with the SEAL teams and, and how you got injured? Well, being in <laughs> Vietnam was great. It, it really was. I uh, I loved it. A little scary, but I, yeah, I don't do fear. I have concerns. But uh, we were out every night. That's when we went out. We didn't go out in the daytime. Although we did a few times, a couple ops came up, something come up, and the uh, the uh, people in Maxog wanted us to go in and take care of something. I don't remember now what it was, but maybe I'd get my notes out and look at them. But we were out every night rooting, tooting, looting, and shooting, and we worked on hard intel. It was over 24 hours old. We didn't use it. And uh, we turned off a lot of birthdays. <laughs> this this was in the Mekong Delta? Yes, we worked the Delta, yeah. Go Kong all over the place, right over to the Cambodian border. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the way it was. So it's, how did uh, you how did, how did get... The Viet, Cong, the Viet Cong thought we were evil spirits, you know, and I had a fake set of teeth, monster teeth that I put in over... A dentist made them for me. I had to make, make them for me before I left. And I had an old black wig I wore and I had an old, old West Virginia hat all pulled down, all wet and, dip, you know, just screwed up hat. And we'd, uh, we'd be interrogating these guys. And, and the, uh, my officer in charge, Lou Boink, I tried, I've been trying to locate him. He retired a captain. He was a Commodore when I was about 30 years in the Navy. And uh, he said, Davis, go put your stuff on. And we're in the hooch. We got this Charlie. And he's sitting over by the fire. <laughs> God, I haven't been thought about this in years. And uh, I'd walk in and he's, he wouldn't talk. He, I'd have to admit, they're pretty tough boys. But when they discovered we were evil spirits, they talked their ass off. And I'd come in by the door, and then he he had a little motion he'd make, and then I'd charge at him. He'd look and see me. His eyes would be as big as his whole face. And I'd charge at him, and two of my platoon mates would grab me. It's all choreographed. They'd grab and hold me, and I'd be hissing and snarling and <laughs> carrying on. And, and uh, our interpreter would tell them that uh, if you don't tell us what we want to know, we're going to let the monster eat you. <laughs> and I'm telling you, that guy, and that about that point, I would break loose and get a hold of the asshole. And I'm telling you, he had started frothing at the mouth. His eyes would roll up in the top of his head. You know, I mean, I guess some sissies would probably think we were terrible people, but we didn't. We came home. And, uh, you know, then they'd make me get out, get, get out, get out. And I'd leave and they'd get him calmed down, wipe all the spittle and shit off of him. And, and he'd talk his ass off. <laughs> I mean, shut up. You're telling us stuff we don't want to know. What about this? What about that? But, you know, that's, that's what we did. And that's what we did for six months. Herschel, tell us about the, the incident where you got injured, though. Well... I was, uh, we, we were on hard intel. We were going down to Snoopy's Nose, which is on the Mekong, and uh, it's just an area. 
And uh, that's what I call, that's what we call, that's what was, in, Intel, that's what it was. And there was a sapper team down there shooting in the Dong Tam, which was an army base, about 10, 12 kilometers from where we were holed up in Mito. And uh, we were taking crews, the provincial reconnaissance unit that we worked with. That was only nine days in country. And uh, it was kind of our first serious good op. We were doing some other stuff, just going out and wandering around, basically. But this was a hard op. And uh, they said, now go out. There was a little clearing about, uh, we were just a blocking force. And the crews, provincial reconnaissance unit, former BC that came over to our side. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> they were, you want to talk about a mercenary, those were mercs. And uh, Anhai, the crew chief, and his RTO was, uh, was in this little clearing out in front of the platoon, but also behind where they were hitting. We were hitting a, a Viet Cong hospital, turning off the uh, doctor and nurses and Viet Cong's birthdays. And uh, one of them got loose. I heard all the shooting and their yellow tracers going and our red going and all that happy horse dung and uh, one of them got loose and I would just knelt down there with my stoner mm -hmm. and Anaheim was about oh probably five five yards over to my right and I was kind of watching the uh, jungle area which was about four yards in front of me and it's a little clearing and I heard this Vietnamese one day, you know, and I'm going, oh, shit, who the hell is that? And I hollered at Anha, 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 and I pointed. I said, VC, VC, crew, VC, you know, what is it? And he was too busy on the radio because everybody was shooting. And the next thing I know, I redirected my attention toward the, toward the jungle and that Charlie stepped out and lit me up. Well, we lit up each other. Because when I saw him, and he was bringing his gun to bear, I fell over backwards with mine and lit, lit him up. But he lit me up, too. So that's how it happened. So you got you took a few Kalashnikov rounds? I, uh, a lot of them went around me. I went between my legs, <laughs> on each side of my head. Oh my I mean, God. if that guy would have held that damn thing steady, steady he'd have killed me. Yeah, yeah. But he was sweeping. He was just sweeping. I guess he thought he was going to cut the grass, too. I don't mm -hmm. know. But uh, <laughs> saved my life. It only took a, I consider it a minor wound, but it got me medevac. And uh, I spent a month in the hospital in uh, Yokosuka, Japan. Before you were able to make and, your escape. Uh, 27 days, actually. I, but I, I he. Oh, please go ahead, Herschel. I'm sorry. No, I just, you know, that stoner. Hey, I had three speeds, but it was a very temperamental weapon. I kept mine on the selector at half speed, about 800 rounds a minute. And I gave him as many as that shit would throw. <laughs> Till I started to stop shooting. And I went, you know, when he hit me, I went, oh, God, what the hell was that? It was like lightning struck me. And then, uh, then I figured out I'm in Sean. And Herschel, that's the name of that tune. Um, I know that for a lot of our listeners and viewers probably know a bit about the history of the UDTs and the SEALs. But, you know, it, you, you, know you, you bring up an interesting point that a lot of, like, younger people might not know about the UDTs and their history and then the SEALs standing up, I think, in, like, 62. So, so, was 62. that right? And then, um, and then you went in in '67. So you had the UDTs, which had. This I went long... in in '65. Oh, in '65. Six six. Six okay. Six. Um, well, actually, '66. I was there at '65, just getting ready, but my class didn't start until January '66. Okay, so the seals were still a relatively new thing when you were there, right? Can you talk about what the UDT was, what, why the seals were stood up, and then? sort of the operational difference between the two when, when they still existed or the UDT still was still there? Frogmen were the 21 foot fathom curve to two miles inland. Okay. That's all we control. That was our, 
That was our area. We did all the hydrogra- hydrographic reconnaissance and welcomed the Marines ashore when they were doing a landing because we were the first ones in there. And uh, that's pretty much how UD2 went. We were all jumpers, you know, and all, all that sort of thing. And becoming experts with our weapons and stuff, uh, although that took some time. Uh, I don't think they took the shooting as serious as I did. And they sent me off to gunsight training center and all that stuff. And I really learned all the stuff I needed to know from Colonel Cooper. And I brought it right back. And we did two months in the desert every year where we trained in Nyland Desert and uh, trained everybody the way I was trained. And we became the best shooting team on the West Coast at that time. And I shot all the West Coast ammo up with my boys. And uh, they they weren't shooters. We were out at, we were out all the time shooting. Yeah, I hey, mean, good God, we're gunslingers for God's sake. If you're not an expert, you're not a team guy, as far as I was concerned. Yeah. And all my boys bought their own personal weapons, turned them into to uh, the armory, and then they'd check them out when they went. Because I shoot nine millimeter, I carried a forty five. But if you can hit them, you don't need 500 rounds in your damn gun because, <laughs> you know, it, most can shoot with it anyway. When I finish with them, they can shoot pretty damn good. Yeah. So, so the well, UDT. Go ahead. I, I, no, I was just asking you. So the UDTs were, like you said, they, they're there to sort of greet them to do the beach clearance and. and and when, our, why primary, this... our, our, our primary, our primary, our primary, primary was to survey the reconnaissance of the for the Marines landing. Okay. That's what, that's the, that's the prime directive right there. Anything else we fell into? Well, that was, yeah, but you came in in the boat, high speed boat, they cast you off. You, you were in a line on the beach, the, the landing beach, and you went in and, you know, every five yards and took soundings, and then you drew up a chart. And we all knew how to do that. Any obstacles, all that stuff. And then we might go back if we had too many obstacles and stuff that would affect the landing craft. We had to go back and put demo on them, blow them up. Mm-hmm. Herschel, uh I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I got to do an ad read real quick, and then we'll jump back into the interview. Um, okay. I just want to tell our listeners out there about Legacy. Legacy provides sperm testing and freezing from home, eliminating the need for visits to a doctor or a traditional fertility clinic. You, uh, Legacy sends you a sample collection kit to your home. Uh, men produce a semen sample at home and send the kit back within 24 hours. The kit contains transport media that keeps the sperm sample fresh until it arri- arrives at the lab. The sample is analyzed, uh, and then by five industry standard metrics of sperm quality, the same provided by traditional fertility clinics are securely sent to the customer's phone within 48 hours. And if a customer chooses uh, to freeze their sperm, the sample will be split and securely stored in two locations to protect it from natural disasters. And Legacy has a relationship with the military. Veterans and members of the armed forces have twice the risk of infertility than the general population. Sperm health can affect the, be affected by lifestyle, age, injury, environment, including exposure to toxic chemicals, such as burn pits, radiation, or pollutants. Hundreds of men in high-risk occupations, like police, firefighters, and members of the military, use Legacy to test and freeze their sperm. This will allow them to produce biological children, even if the unthinkable happens. The military's healthcare system offers limited options for couples diagnosed with infertility and no coverage for proactive fertility preservation. Legacy is committed to supporting the military vet, military veterans uh, and their family members. Legacy's special relationship with the military includes several participants, such as the Military Family Building Coalition, Naval Special Warfare, Operation Baby Foundation, Veterans Advantage, and the Green Beret Foundation. Legacy's Board of Advisors includes the Honorable Dr. David Shulkin, a board-certified internist and widely respected healthcare executive who served as the ninth secretary of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. He says, quote, for men who have served in our recent conflicts, approximately 14% experience infertility issues. 
Legacy can provide help to those who want to preserve their ability to have a family. This is one way we can support and honor our commitment to those who served, end quote. So please go and check them out, folks. You can find them at givelegacy.com. It's givelegacy.com. Okay, Herschel, thank you for standing by. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> so, uh, so you talk about, like, the UDT's mission. The SEALs then were st stood up as, uh, kind of a, as part of or an offshoot of UDT. Like, they used the guys from UDT. Can you tell us what what the purpose of the SEALs was and why it kind of became a whole separate unit? Inland penetration. Okay. Inland penetration. And we were an offensive unit. We were not defensive. <clears throat> we worked in 14-man platoons. And in Vietnam, they brought, unless we were on a major op where we were hitting a whole bunch of people, a squad, seven men, we, <clears throat> by description, we would, uh, we would engage 50 of the bad guys because usually we, we have surprise on our side and most of them would be gone <laughs> the first 10 seconds for God's sakes. But, you know, ambushes, stuff like that. We, and we worked right in their backyard. So they, uh, they felt rather secure, I guess. I don't know what the hell they felt. They, they felt pretty bad when we got them, but, uh, other than that, that's, that's how it worked, you know, but we're, we were the inland boys and we we're very offensive. And, uh, you know, and after, you... Uh, after, after you made your escape from Japan and rejoined your unit, you said you kind of went right back out that night with your platoon? I sure did. They had, they had what's the word, savaged all my gear. They had all my stuff. I had to go around and get noisy and get my shit back and my gun and all my paraphernalia. And that only took about an hour. It was daytime. They were all right there. So, we, uh, but I, I made my, my hand was very raw as part of the wound. So I, uh, got one of my, I had a pair of black gloves and I took one black glove, cut the fingers off cause I lost a couple of fingers. And, uh, I just got that all sewed up and fixed up. So that protected that part. So I was good to go. And good what, what, what was the rest of your, uh, your tour in Vietnam like? Oh, you know, Liberty, going down to the bar on the, right on the water. And, you know, we had different people come in, you know, uh, reporters and stuff, trying to shake us down for information and stuff like that. And, you know, it's, you know, well, we hear you're, uh, you guys collect ears. We don't collect ears. You got God, I don't know where the hell that shit came from. You got to be a little sick. You want to be cutting body parts off dead Viet Cong and saving them. What the hell for? So we, we had one guy, I forgot who he was with, but yeah. what's that damn outfit, that news agency, it's international. He uh, it was an American, but you know, the, <laughs> uh, a dried up here, I would imagine looks a lot like an apricot. And, uh, well, <laughs> An officer we had uh, that came and visited us. Who I was telling him about it. This guy thinks he wants to see our ears. Oh man, I got the perfect thing. So we we had a can of a uh, of uh, apricots, you know, all peeled and everything. You know, little round square things. Dried apricots. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, he, he dried out. Yeah, dried out. And he made a necklace out of one with probably fifteen, <laughs> twenty years on it, and he gave it to me. <laughs> and I went down there and I said, okay, okay, okay. You want to see it? I'm going to show it to you. Don't touch it. You got it? Oh, God. Yeah, show me, Davis. Show me. And I said, that's what it looks like right there. And I held it up. Then I jerked one off and ate it. I thought he was never going to stop puking. I think he pews these nuts up. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but that, you know, that's the way, that's life in the teams. You know, we all harass each other. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's doing funny shit. Yeah. You, you, you were in, a, you were in the Rangers. You do the same damn thing. <laughs> yeah. That's how it goes. You know, you're, you're spec, spec ops, you guys, the main force unit, we're the little piddly boys. So that's, uh, that's the way it works. So what was your next stop like, uh, in the Navy after that tour in Vietnam? 
Well, I, you know, I went back to the States and then they sent me off to Spanish language school because we needed to go down to Columbia, South America and train the uh, Colombian frogmen mm-hmm. to be SEALs. And uh, the first group that went down there got a little cocky, I guess, which narcissism is, uh, is, was, is very prevalent in SEAL teams. You know, I, I had a little trouble with that and, uh, I had my ways of taking care of it, but you know, mostly the guys been nowhere, done nothing. They're awful cocky. What are you cocky about? You haven't done damn thing yet. Swam out in the ocean. Woo. How exciting. But, uh, you know, that's, uh, so where was I going with this? Down, uh, getting sent down to Columbia to train their fo- frogmen. Oh yeah. Down to Columbia. And that was good. I was, I was down there for almost six months and, uh, with a group of guys. I was the chief then and uh, had a master chief in charge, uh, had an officer also, but he he wasn't like us. We're getting involved with the guys. We're out doing our thing. Of course, we're training hard, but uh, we were very respectful of them and everything, and uh, we did a good job. We did a good job. There's only one or two of them boys left, unfortunately. But we uh, we went to the party. We financed everything. We really took good care of them, mm-hmm. and uh, they didn't have a lot, but they they had enough. And uh, that was a six month tour. You know, it's it, it goes so fast when you're having a good time. Yeah, you know? yeah, it just yeah. does. My life is gone. I'm eight, coming eighty three, and it's like I woke up, had breakfast, and it's time to die. <laughs> I mean, it's just. It went by so fast. I try to recall stuff, and I'm going. People will bring stuff up. I'll run into somebody, and a lot of the old guys like me are gone. And uh, but her so and so, you remember so and so? Well, spike my memory, and you know, and they get me going. One of one of the things that I always thought about you, whenever we've spoken in the past, is that you were somebody who absolutely loved being a frogman. Like it was your passion. No. and I mean, you were there for thirty something years. Obviously, you loved it. I would stay, I'd still be in the Navy if they'd have kept me. But after I had 34 <laughs> years, I had, I had one admiral who gave me my extra four years. He said, will you go to Panama and during the invasion? I will go to hell if you'll give me more years. I'll give you four more years. You go down and take that slot. We need you in Panama. And I said, I'm in. And, uh, oh, well, to, uh, to, to back up a little bit before Panama, um, you ended... Yeah, 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 that's you, way at the end. By, by you know, 19... Well, we're getting to, like, the 1970s, mid-1970s, uh, UDT-12 and then UDT-11, SEAL Team 5, into the into 1980s. Um, what was what was that part well, of your no, career? No, no. Uh, two of those are West Coast. I'm on the East Coast. I went to SEAL Team 2. Meaning disconnected. What's that mean? Uh, we lost your video. We still have your audio, though. Oh, we're back. We're back. Okay. okay. We're back. All right. Yeah. Please. Uh. Please. Please continue. Um. What What was the next part of your career like? Well, you know, Vietnam. Then that's when I went to Colombia. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is this working? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We We can We can hear you, Herschel. Yeah. We can. We can hear you. Oh, they're talking on the TV now. <laughs> but the phone's better. Um, can you, but he, uh, Columbia was right after it. You know, uh, I never got to go back cause the war was over. They sent me to South America mm-hmm. and, uh, we did the Columbia thing and then came back and went off to halo school. Oh God. I just saw uh, doing stuff all the time. Um, yeah, so so yeah, they kept you busy. Um, what what were you doing through like you know the mid nineteen seventies to the mid nineteen eighties? What was that part of your career like? Quick, I was gone <laughs> most of the time. I did thirty four years in the Navy. I did twenty four years in foreign countries, mostly toilets, bad places where bad guys are. And uh, but my my wife was very loyal. We we. We made it 39 years, and then she just told me, uh, Herschel, you're, you're just an asshole. I said, well, of course I am. What's your point? And, uh, you know, I, 
I'm I, I had it with you. So that was a, a bummer. Yeah, I'm I sorry. didn't feel real good about it, but uh, that's the way life is. But we're good buddies now. But you won't remarry me. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. I tried. I did, but I take good care of her. She remarried some asshole that was abusive. And he don't know how close he came to getting his birthdays turned off. But uh, she's a good Catholic girl like I am now, I hope. And, uh, oh, dear God, Herschel, please. I said, divorce him then. And I'll take care of you. You don't have to. Yes, I do. I caused this. I'll take care of you. And I do. And I have. Mm -hmm. And I got everything set up that when I go, and I'll probably go first, quadruple bypasses from Agent Orange and all the rest of the bullshit that's associated with being a military man. But I don't let it get me down. I do what I can, when I can, where I can. So that's good enough for me. I don't have no fear of death. How in the hell do you do shit like we did if you're afraid of dying? It's true. Um, yeah. So what... Uh... I had I had scaredy cats, you know. I said, hey, you know, this isn't for you. You ought to, you know, go drive a milk truck or something because you're, you know, you're, you're too worried about shit that you shouldn't be thinking about. We're deployed. What, uh, what, what but, do you... Yeah. Do you have any recollections sure. about some of those other trips that you made after Vietnam, so, like Colombia, any other places that you ended up that the Navy sent you? Oh, God, Australia. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, let me just think. I've been all over the world. Australia, France, of course, England with the SAS. Uh, oh, shit, let that, that, me just... Just keep asking me questions. That that gets me going. Yeah, I mean, I'm just um, uh, I'm just looking at the resume they sent me, and uh, I mean, maybe it's not right, but it, it says UDT 12, 90, uh, 1977 and 1981, and then UDT 11, SEAL Team 5, 1981 to 1987. Right, right, and uh, I was a command master chief by then. That's when I went to the East, West Coast. Okay. Because uh, all the East Coast teams had master chiefs, old guys. They're the one, they're the old guys that were. I'm the new guy. They're the old guys, and I made mass chief rather early in my navy career, in 15 years. And shit, I didn't know shit from Shinola, but I was trying to learn. And uh, I just went to the West Coast. I called a guy named Al Winters. He was a skipper of Team 12. I said, if you'll make me the command mass chief, I'll come to West Coast. He said you got the job. He, uh, the, you know. Not all men are created equal. He had a guy that just spent more time in college and other things and wasn't too concerned about getting out and running and swimming and doing all the things you need to do. So <clears throat> I got the job, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that was a, it was good tour of duty. And then I became uh, Command Master Chief of Naval Special Warfare Group 1 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of all the SEAL teams. I did that for a couple of years and went to the PI and Korea and Thailand, you know, pick one over there. I've been to all of them mm -hmm. and uh, just doing team stuff. And that's, you know, what SEALs do is like you guys and the Rangers, what Rangers do. All training, on ops, mm -hmm. teaching mm -hmm. people. Couldn't speak any of the languages, though. Dear <laughs> God. And and then you said they That's, sent they sent you down to Panama during the invasion. Yeah, yeah, I went uh, that was you know then I went uh, after a naval special warfare group. Uh, a new commodore came, one I liked. The other one sucked me out of the teams. I didn't want to be in. Yeah, they didn't want to leave an operational SEAL team to be a desk jockey at naval special warfare group. But he let me do a couple things, but not near enough. Mm. And I got my buns out of there because they needed a, uh, where the hell did I go after that? I went uh, to uh, Team 11. Team 11 was, well, it was on its ass. And oh, really? uh, poor management. And 
retired Captain R.J. Thomas. He was the commander then. He was the ops boss at Naval Special Warfare Group. And the Commodore calls him in. He goes, I want you to go to Team 11. I want you to be the Master Chief there. I want you to go with R.J. That's the Commodore. That's not in my career plans. And then he took the Lord's name in vain. And Davis, I said, and I seen I was getting his eye. <laughs> he was getting fired up, but he was noted for that. I really liked him. He's gone too. But uh, I said, well, give me 24 hours to think on it, can you? Best damn tour I ever had. My really? God, I couldn't do anything wrong. I was, everything was uphill, but that's okay. I fired 20, and uh, I'll be put 20 on the street, and uh, we had it. We got a team together. You and then Team 11 was con- redesignated SEAL Team 5, and it just got even better. And uh, after that, when I went on to do other things, and that's when I went to Panama. Herschel, can you talk a little bit about that? Like, what happened at SEAL Team 11? How did it sort of go off the rails? And then what what uh, did you and the new I, commanding... I can, sum it up. I can sum it up in just a few words. Okay. Lack of leadership. Mm. I had guys... There were, well, of course, we have a 70% drinking problem in the teams, or did in those days. There was only 260 of us during Vietnam. Yeah. There's over 3,000 now. Yeah. But... Uh, so you probably got a little riffraff in there. We had a little riffraff with 260. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, they were just drugs, you know. Drugs were a lot more prevalent on the West Coast than they were on the East Coast. I guess uh-huh. closer to Mexico, I guess, you had a closer supply line or something. I don't know. I didn't care. But if you did drugs, you were done in my world. I'd have shot your ass if they'd let me. I have skippers. Can I, can I say that? Let me execute two or three of these at quarters. We can stop this problem. Oh, dear God. Master Chief, are you crazy? Well, yeah. Why? you got to be crazy <laughs> to do this shit. <laughs> but, it, uh, what what, what, what did you do? I, I mean, as far as, like, leadership is, uh, how did you come in and, like, shape, shape things up? I'm a gargoyle. That's all. I'm not. I'm a pussy. But they don't know that. <laughs> I have a great facade. I didn't have to beat the shit out of anybody, but, you know, I was uh, I was serious. I was very serious, and I was loud. And they'd come in, and I one I remember, he came in, he goes, he'd been snorting cocaine. We caught him. I had, we'd have lockdowns. I'd, I'd say to the skipper, we need to have one right now. Okay, Davis, we lock the doors, nobody leaves. Docs come in, everybody pee test, everything, they come back positive. And I say, you're done. Your career's over, buddy. You're not a frogman anymore. You're nothing. Mm. And if I could, I'd shoot your ass. And get out of my fucking office. And he starts crying. My wife made me do it. Now I really want your ass out of here. Your wife made you do it. Trying to throw his wife under the ass. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. You're not a seal. You're a fucking pussy. But anyway, but I'm, you know, that's part of leadership. You got to have the gargoyle. You got to have the good guy, which I was 99% of the time. But that 1%, yeah. you got to be an evil son of a bitch. And it don't make you feel good, mm. Jack. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's not something you take a lot of pride in. Oh, you know, I threw so-and-so out of the fucking Navy. Blah, blah. You know, I'm not like that. Yeah, yeah, I'm going, and I meet these guys now at reunions, and they'll come up. And I say, "Hey, come here. When, how you doing? How's it going? Oh God, it's going great, Mass Chief. God, I'm surprised you'd even speak to me. Why wouldn't I? I just held you accountable for your actions. That's all. Mm-hmm. And hopefully, it obviously it took hold of you, didn't it? Right, right, right. You, what are you doing? You know, and oh, well, I'm very successful. I'm this. I'm that. I'm doing this. I'm married. I got kids." You know, got their so, life on track. Actually, I helped the guy. He probably thought I was fucking him, but I, I wasn't. I was holding him accountable for his actions. Yeah, yeah. There has to be there has that, to be some sort of standard. And that's leadership. That's mm-hmm. all leadership stuff. You know, but you got to be the bad guy. You got to be the good guy. Um. So then you're down. You get down to Panama, 
And do you want to talk a little bit about the Bolivia trip and how that came about in the 90s? Oh, Just Cause? <laughs> well, well, Just yeah, Cause was yeah, Panama, but then Bolivia with uh, the Escobar thing. Oh, Pablo, I just missed getting that son of a bitch. <laughs> we were coming in, and I was, I was in violation of Posse Comitatus and the Manchester Act. You know, as military, active duty military, I was not allowed to go in the field. But I was with some real god dang big ball DEA guys. Larry Levron, he's passed away, too. He died of he, cancer. He passed away? I didn't know that. 60. Say again? I didn't, I didn't know Larry passed away. I haven't spoken to him in a few, in a few years, obviously. Well, uh, I had been down, uh, visiting him. I mean, I, I keep... I keep track of my buds. I really yeah, do. No, Larry sorry, and I spent a good, 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 good time together. And he was in Florida, and Florida's a nice place to go. And I was just I was visiting somebody, uh, a troop I had that, that got out of the Navy, uh, uh, Sellers. He got married, and his wife didn't want to be a frog man, but he joined the Army. And, oh, it's just so there's a lot of stories. And he was just, he would still be alive today if he had stayed in the teams. He really was. He just passed away, but... You know, and I was close, so I just drove down to Florida and hung out with Larry a little bit. That's, uh, uh, but he asked me one time, so I was training the Umapar for him, mm. the uh, Colombian police, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Koyas and the Combas. The Combas were the Altiplanos or one or the other, I can't remember for sure, and the Koyas were in the jungle. And they're, they're the two should meet. So what the DEA did is swap them out because South America is so corrupt anyway. Good God. It was, and I, and I had, I had two Cabos. I had two Cabos that were just outstanding. I mean, they were great. They were, had a quality of leadership. The uh, corporals. And, and uh, the damn uh, officer you know, he'd been one that got Che Guevara. And he, God dang, phone, get up. Everybody calls when you're on the phone. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and he was a piece of shit, and he was stealing everything. And we'd go in, we'd hit a hooch looking for druggies, and uh, he'd be taking their chickens and their meat and all kind of stuff. You know, he's stealing from them. So I had to take him aside because the Cabos were afraid to say anything to him, you know? Mm. You know, the, the, the South America is the poor and destitute and the ones that got money and stuff. There's no middle class, mm. or at least there wasn't there when I was there. But I really, I took care of my boys. God dang, they had big balls. And uh, I just took him aside and I just told him, I said, if you want something, you buy it. You understand me? I will turn your damn birthday off, buddy, and I'll leave you in the jungle. Oh, he hated me. I didn't give a shit. I've been hated before. There's probably a lot of people still hate me. But uh, they shouldn't. I just held them accountable. And the Cabos, man, they became really close to me then. You, 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 did you, you did that? Of course I did it. I'm in charge. He's not. And uh, they did some outstanding stuff. And now there were bonuses that were available. And I went to Larry, who was the head of the DEA team, and I said, I want to give uh, bonuses to uh, my two Cabos. Okay, I'll, set, I'll get that set up. And I said, we're going to do it a little different. We do not give the money to the officers to give to the men. <laughs> right. They never get it. Really? No, they don't get it. So we will present the money to them up here with no officers around. All right, Master Chief, that's the way you want to do it. So, and then he comes, Larry comes to me and he goes, will you go on ops with us? Will I go on ops with you? Does <laughs> howdy duty have a wooden dick? Hell yeah, I'll go on ops with you. <laughs> and uh, so I started going on ops. I stole my gear. I, and the helos, all my operational battle rattle, and away we went. And I was on ops with them all the time. It was great. I mean, good God. 
I was I trained the boys too, but when we had ops, I got on them. Yeah. And we had a detachment. We had a detachment, a small platoon of uh, SF boys there. All the, the chief, well, I say the chief, the E seven and the other ranks, cool dudes. God, my flavor. But the guy in charge was a fucking dickhead. And uh, Davis, and, you know, they couldn't go on off, right? and they didn't. And Davis, where where were you yesterday? Oh, I just out fooling around. Uh, you going on ops, aren't you? What are you talking about? I can't do that. So he reported me to, to La Paz, the headquarters, the mill group. And I get a call. Colonel, uh, what the hell was his name? Colonel Umpty Squats wants to see you, Davis. We're sending a helo for you. Well, it wasn't a helo. It was fixed wing. It cost a 212. So I flew in. I went up, locked my heels in front of his desk. Master Chief, are you going on ops in violation of Posse Comitatus in Manchester? Colonel, do you think I would do that? Hell no, I wouldn't think that. Yeah, hell no. You take three days, have a good time. Should he answer his own question? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I hung out for about three days and, you know, done some cumbia, went to the dance halls and stuff, and got my ass back on the airplane, got back down with the boys. You, Herschel, do you want and to I tell us the, the story about how you and Larry almost, uh, you know, crossed paths with Pablo Escobar? Well, we were coming in. We, we heard about he was in country because that's where he got a lot of his uh, his powder. And usually we'd burn up the, you know, that's all we did was hit. Mm-hmm. Uh, the drug labs. Sites where they cook, where they were cooking, making the shit up and drying it out. And then that's where a lot of that came out of that way, went into Columbia and then went on up to America. That's where most of it went. And uh, we were ter- we'd blow the ops up. And, of course, the, the, uh, the Umapar... I'd say, okay, now, guys, here's how it works. There's a lot of shit there that you can turn into money or you can keep it. So they're personal guarantee stuff that's yours. You get a piece, you get a piece, you all can't take everything to one guy. And I worked it out to where they all got compensated that way and all that stuff. And only one time the, the druggies were usually boy, they'd haul ass into the jungle. But one of them was one of the honcho's sons, and he popped out of the jungle with a AR, I guess it was, and he started popping at us. And my two cabos, buddy, they could shoot. They blowed that boy into eternity. Bang, bang, bang. Took a quarter size, half dollar size, through his chest, out of his spine. That was cool as hell. I just really, I felt very comfortable out in the bush with those guys. And We and just the- took on a whole bunch. And then the, the, the one where you guys did the helicopter assault on Pablo's Finca. Say again? Uh, when, when you guys did the helicopter assault force mission on Pablo's Finca. Yeah, well, you know, the, the, the way we would hit Fincas, we hit a lot of Fincas. Because we knew this, bad, this group was bad, this group was bad. Mm-hmm. But, you know, they'd hear the helos coming, and then they'd haul ass. So we started doing stuff to where we would go 180 out from there, set them down, and then we patrol in, mm-hmm. and then we catch them flat-footed. And, so and, and Pablo's and, place was down by way down off one of the canals, and when we went in, it, it was a hot area. They they popped at us, but we lit them up. But he had when we were coming in, there was a twin-engine airplane took off a dirt strip. They were they were climbing out as we were coming in, and Pablo was in that vehicle. But I saw Pablo dead on the ground where he uh, was in a uh, house down in uh, Bogota. Oh, one of the uh, one of the damn God, I can't remember the name of the town he he hung out in where his wife was. But we hit that place. We blowed his guard away, bodyguard, and then he thought he could get away 
and we got him up on the roof and he fell off and he was dead. And you, were, you, were, was you were there on, and then, and you were there in Columbia when that happened? I was right there. I looked at him. Holy shit. I didn't know that, Herschel. Well, it's no big deal. I mean, he's a dead man. I've seen a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so wait, w w walk me through this a little bit. Like, w were you there with the, what was it, search block, the Colombian unit that found him? Yeah, the Umapar, the uh, Colombian police. Yeah. Yeah. Coyas. Co no, they're Combus. They were, we had the Combus down in the... Uh, Jungle area and stuff down south. On the, you know, the Altiplano. On the other side is where all, all the property was. Then it was all, you know, uh, pinkas and stuff and crops and cattle and all that stuff on, on the, uh, the eastern side of the Altiplano. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how it works, and you know. So that that was a... just moving all the time, moving all the time, and. Had one other young seal with me, good guy. Can't remember his name. He was an Italian name, but he went on became an officer. He was a good guy. He was at Paitia when the seals got a bunch of seals got blown away. I was at the funeral for those boys. You know they they had a uh, group of seals trained for two months for that op. Then this uh, third polisher changed everything and put a bunch of green guys in there. And they they patrolled in wrong. They they just did it all wrong and got themselves killed. What 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 mission was that got, again? Herschel? Got shot up. Got shot up. Killed the chief. It's bad bad juju. What what juju. what what, what, <laughs> what mission was that? That went bad. Well, there's not so much coordination. It's just their damn movement. Walking up the runway. Oh yeah. Oh, we did the Panama. invasion. Good yeah. God. You yeah. know we had houses and all kind of stuff. You stalk you. Move around, come in at night, be ready to go in the morning. I mean, come on. Yeah. You know, well, it's do, you, do you know juju. why they, they took out the guys who had been rehearsing for that and put in like a, a greener, a newer team that, that had, wasn't ready? I'm sorry, I didn't follow that. Do you know Say why? Again? Yeah, do you know why they took out the team that had been training for that? And then, like you said, put in a oh, green team. Oh, I have team. no idea. I have no idea. Yeah. I mean, I'm in the jungle. I have no idea what's going on back in Little Creek. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, it's it's all it's all officer stuff. You know, some, yeah, sometimes I wonder how they think. Officers in the SEAL teams get a couple of operational tours. Then they're desk yeah. jockeys and, you know, joint staffs, all that stuff, making rank. Yeah, you know, and I and and I never wanted to be one. After after that, I, I just I, it's the best thing ever happened to me. Flunking advanced thermal, God must have known, and he <laughs> screwed my brain up, and I couldn't figure that shit out. Yeah, I mean, if you look up Command Master Chief in the dictionary, I'm pretty sure there's a picture of your face there that accompanies the definition. Partner, I draw more. I draw more water than anybody but the captain, <laughs> and I'm the captain's right hand man. His office and my office were connected by a doorway, and uh, you know, it's you know, I'm, I'm not trying to brag, but I mean, if you want to be a command master chief, then you 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 take a handle on things. You know, my skipper get a little pissed at me. He'd go, good God, Herschel, can't you calm down? Sir, I never learned how to polish a turd. <laughs> Davis, go back to your office. I don't, I don't, I don't want to talk to you no more. And, you know, and then I come back and I say, you still mad at me? Oh, I'm not mad at you. Where in the hell did you come up with that? Well, you know me, I got all kind of little sayings. So if you want to learn some, I can teach you. No, no, no. No, I don't want to learn any. I'm fine. <laughs> Herschel, yeah, he's a good skip. We're still uh, good buddies. We're still good buddies. Did thir thirty some odd years in the Navy. Um, you know, by the by the you know early to mid nineteen nineties, you're getting towards the end of your career and hitting quote unquote retirement, which you you explained 93. to me. Ninety three. Ninety three. They throwed me away. And and you felt that retirement was basically a bunch of bullshit and didn't like it so much. So you went and found other things to do. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your post-Navy career? Well, 
you know, I, I really like guns. So I had retirement, and I worked at gun site for about seven years. Not a lot. I mean, you get a couple of tours, a couple of classes a year and stuff. And uh, I, then I built a bed and breakfast up there and uh, provided housing for uh, clients. And uh, that's why I lived up there. And then the kids and mom would come up and visit, or I'd go down there and visit with them when I had some free time. But that gave me something to do 24-7, maintaining the lodge and training when they had a class for me and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That's how Mm -hmm. it worked. Kept my skills up, and I did that for a while. And then... uh, Then... uh, the uh, well, I got a call one day from a petty officer that was in Team 5 with me. And he had done very well, and he was the president of Blackwater, working for Eric Prince. And we talked. He was good, good friend. God, I like that guy. He was squared away. He wasn't one of the narcissist boys. And uh, we were talking on the phone. I said, what the hell are you guys doing? I understand you're over in... Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, all them kid holes. What's going on? Well, we're doing blah, 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 blah. And I went, God, I'd love to do that. Son of a bitch. Master Chief, are you serious? Are you serious? As a heart attack. That's how serious I am. If I could go and do that, I'd do it in a heartbeat. All right. Can can you come down here and and run a class for us uh, in in uh, Currituck, or well, Moyoc, yeah, North Carolina. I live in Currituck, and I said, "Hell yeah, I can!" <laughs> and he said, "Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go over and uh, work in Pakistan. I just one of the boys. I wasn't a C1. I was just one of the boys." And then he called me while I was over there, and he goes, "We're opening up a place in Pakistan." where we have predators and stuff. I'm probably talking about shit. I ought to keep them out. Well, we're not doing it anymore. So, uh, would you, could you go there and take that over? <laughs> how to, you know, I've done the how to duty thing. So I'd find something else. Anyway, I said, hell yeah. So I, I stayed there. I didn't come home. Most people were coming out for 60 days. Then they go home and that's about all they could take. Cause it's 139 degrees in the desert southern part of Pakistan, hotter than a fresh fucked fox in a forest fire. But, uh, you know, it's, you get used to it. You get used to it. It's dry heat. <laughs> Whatever the hell that is. It's in dry heat. What, what, is, but, what, what uh, did they have you doing, uh, like mobile protection details or something? Well, no, we weren't protecting. We were, uh, we were guarding the base. Gotcha. We okay. covered the base. We had outposts, and then we would make sorties. And that's where Alex, not yeah, Alexander the Great, yeah, Ali, Alex, the uh, the Greek, right? Yeah, yeah. Macedonian. He, he came through, and, and he that's where he stopped right there in Pakistan, right there in the Shamsi Valley, and an old fort was just ten clicks up the road, you know. And when I found that out, I I just took one of the trucks, I went up there and checked it out, and that's cool. It's all run down and everything, but. Just to be there on that thing, yeah. that old. Are you kidding me? Yeah. So, you know, but I took the guys up. He said, Messi, can we go? Hell yeah, you can go get in the truck. Let's go. <laughs> and you watch. You know, they all, I got them set up to where they did eight hour watches. So it was, it was good. Initially, when I got there, there was only 11 of us, and I was on the watch bill. I wasn't going to be C1 and not be on the watch bill when we don't have anybody much. And uh, we we worked our ass off twelve hour shifts and uh, got paid a lot too though. That's the first time in my life I made any money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, what came after uh, after the Pakistan job? What was the next one for you? Oh, Pakistan. Wait, let me think. Let me think. What, what the hell were those? Years? Oh, uh, I started working at a police academy up in uh, DuPage, Illinois. Mm-hmm. Still do. I teach again in uh, November or January, June, June, June. Awesome. And uh, so, uh, you know, out on the range, and then I uh, had a class, classroom, 
for a uh, my uh, my boss, Mr. Chief. Can can you change your language a little bit? <laughs> you know, you're in the civilian sector, and <laughs> you uh, some of the things you say are pretty shocking. No shit. <laughs> Well, what kind of pussies are we training? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, being, I'm being facetious. But, but it's true, though, because it, as police officers, they're going to be exposed to way harsher language when they're actually out on the job. Well, you know, they're, nowadays they're not. Yeah, I'll tell you right now, yeah, well, I appreciate the, fam fa the famous phrase that they used. And when somebody's cussing them, Calling them ten motherfuckers a second. Well, I appreciate what you're saying, sir, but couldn't I just get a little cooperation? I just shot the son of a bitch, the first motherfucker. <laughs> but uh, you can't do that. That's against the law. And uh, I'd be shooting people every day until they got me if I wasn't concerned about my mortal soul. And I don't we, know we if you guys are Yeah, we should, we should mention that I, you're a reformed man now, Herschel, and that you follow the teachings of Christ. I do. I do, and I follow it good, buddy. I'm <laughs> on it. I'm at Time Miss Church, but once in six years, and I tithe, and I do my thing. I say my prayers. You know, I'm, I'm a good Catholic boy. Finally, I started out a good Catholic boy, then the military... <laughs> <laughs> and and you don't you don't unbirthday people even when they deserve it. No, no, I, uh, I I could, but unfortunately that's murder and that's a mortal sin. I try not to commit those anymore. Yeah, I've done enough. I just they say the boss is very forgiving, so but he's got a lot of forgiving to do for this old. <laughs> <laughs> Her, her show, I, I, I apologize. I apologize every day. You know, the well, devil made me do that. You know, God, keep that son of a bitch away from me. <laughs> I, uh, but uh, that, uh, that's the way I talk to him. I, I'm really I talk sure. to him just like I talk to you. I do. You know, and I'm not embarrassed to say that at all. I talk to him just like I talk to you, only I use very nice language. <laughs> I, don't, uh, I don't use the F word. But my priest told me, he said, you know, dirty words are not a sin, Master Chief. I said, really? Yeah, you got to quit coming to confession with just using <laughs> impure language. The only reason it becomes a sin is when you call somebody things like that. Well, I don't do that. Well, then you're not sinning. They're just English words. You shouldn't use them. Now, don't get me wrong. You shouldn't use them if you don't have to. I can't imagine why you need to. But it's okay. Well, fuck it then, Father. I'm going to do it. <laughs> He goes, dear God in heaven, I've got work to do with you. I said, that's your job. That's your job. Get me squared away. But, you know, I, what am I going to do with you, Master Chief? Just take the money and help the poor. I'm really curious in terms of, you know, you were there when the SEAL teams were relatively new. You were there when the UDT teams went away. You, so you've seen the culture change, if it was a culture change, but you've seen the changes uh, from you know underwater demolitions through the SEAL teams and all that. How did you, like when the UDTs went away, did you think that's fine because like the SEALs are doing no, that job? No, no, I like being a frog man. I like being a frog man. I did the SEAL thing. But we took over all the requirements of being UDT in the SEAL team. So we added that to, so now we're from 21 fathom curve all the way into the capital. So, yeah. you know, it's uh, whatever. Yeah. So you... we just took that job and they call us SEALs now because that acronym, I guess, is much more important than UDT. Oh, my God, you say, you, you say SEAL to some people, my God, they drop down on their knees and start praying. I'm going, what the Sam hell? And everybody knows about us now. Back when I was there, most, even the Navy guys didn't know. Yeah. They saw my insignia. It looks like the big Budweiser label. And uh, what is that? No, it's SEAL insignia. What the hell is SEAL? Frogman. Really? Really? That's the biggest damn insignia I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I have to agree with you there. Whoever designed it was had an ego big one. But, uh, 
you know, it's. Uh, did, did you? Did just you, the way it was. I was very lucky. I've been blessed. I have been blessed, and I thank the boss quite often for looking after me because I have suffered gunshot wounds, broken this. You know, what's the hell the, the chest thing over my chest up? I'm running on. I used to have fire hoses for blood veins to my heart. Now I got garden hoses. So, yeah, I've had to slow down a little bit. This stroke got me slowed down. I had a stroke in September. I'm sorry. And uh, my doctor goes, well, you can't run around like a wild man. Master Chief, you're 82 years old. <laughs> So, what am I supposed to stop? You know, it's attitude. I got a good one. Well, slow down or you're, you're going to die. I'm not afraid to die. Boss wants me. I'm out of here. What am I going to do with you? Well, is there a pill I can take? <laughs> <laughs> and you, you put, yeah, there is a lot of my take. So I, <laughs> I take them. I take them. When? Yeah. I've when got them the, all divvied up. I do about three times a day. I take some. There's so damn many. Plus, I take my supplements, too. Yeah. Everybody thinks I'm about 65 years old. I said, well, I look 65, I think. I don't think so. I think I look 200, personally. But everybody goes, how old are you, man? She's about 65, 66, 82. Oh, bullshit. I said, well, that's what my credit card says. <laughs> anyway. anyway, that's... That's the way it works. I hope I've made sense. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm curious, when, when the UDTs went away and the SEALs took over that mission, you said that, you know, they had everything from, was it the two fathoms or five fathoms? Do, do you feel that's... Yeah, 21 fathom curve. 21 fathom 21 curve. 21 fathom curve to the, uh, well, there's no limit. In yeah. yeah do you, we used to be in UDT limited two miles. Oh, every now and then you, you wind up farther in than two miles, but... You know, you're looking around and say, well, what are we supposed to do now? Well, let's steal something. <laughs> do, do, you, uh, do you feel, because uh, it seems like the, the SEALs, because of their mission set, have to maintain a lot of different requirements, right? They have the land mm -hmm. warfare. They have the, uh, the underway stuff, you know, the, the, uh, the um, ship interdiction Arm. stuff, things like that. Do you feel like it's too large of a mission set? To, to ask? It, no, it, no, no, no. Okay. Here's, here's how it works. Okay. We used to have two SEAL teams. But when they became, UDT became SEALs, we have on the West Coast, we have Team 3, Team 5, Team 7, Team, uh, well, Team 10, that's a dev group. And then on the, on the East Coast, we've got, oh, God, we've got uh, SEAL Team 2. All equal numbers, SEAL Team 4, SEAL Team 8, and uh, there's no and SEAL Team 10. That's where that's at. And then uh, out on, on the West Coast, we got SDV Team 1, SDV Team 2 over here, and I think they've moved all them to Hawaii. So, you know, we have a lot of teams now, and each team has certain areas that they're responsible for, okay? Like my team, Team 5, we were the Alaska boys. We had all the... All the uh, cold weather stuff, Canada and a few Greenland and blah, 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 and South America. Uh, yeah, South America. And then, you know, another team's got the, the Asia area. Now, the, the world is broken up into different areas. You know, the, there's a team designated, I think it's Team 3 for the Middle East. But. When there's combat going on, when we're at war in that area, all the teams take a turn. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. it does. So, so they're... The <laughs> Vietnam, are able to... Vietnam was SEAL Team 2's, but SEAL Team 3 was taken off there, too. We, we would relieve them, they would relieve us. We, yeah. You know, they didn't, they didn't get to do it all, and then they couldn't because there wasn't enough of us. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible when you say there's only like 260 SEALs during the Vietnam War. Yeah. I mean, it was a really, that must, that's a really tight-knit crew right there. We were busy. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, it's yeah. great. You, you want to be. Mm -hmm. You don't have time to think. 
How, how are you feeling, Master Chief? Both hands. <laughs> what else you got? Uh, any other stories from your contracting years during the War on Terror years that, that come to mind that you'd like to tell us? Well, you know, that memories come and go. Mm. You know, I, I get to talking to somebody and went, holy shit, I didn't even tell you about this. So, you know, you, you just got to prod me with a question, you know. Uh, Any time in Iraq and, or Afghanistan, for instance? Oh, Afghanistan. Well, we were down in the desert. Every now and then we get up to Islamabad to get checked out with a doctor or something or check in with somebody. You know, that was kind of a pleasure trip. And I let as many boys go as wanted to. You know, hey, it's your turn. You want to get up to Islamabad and see what, what they're doing up there to screw things up? <laughs> yeah, you know, I'd like to, yeah. You know, and then the DEA head guy come down and, you know, well, you, you shouldn't be doing it. We do what we need to do to get it done. Why are you flying a Jolly Roger? What the hell does a flag matter? The men like it. I like the men to like things. Yeah. You get that flag down. You know, I mean, where, where in the hell did you come from? Well, I was in the Marine Corps. I was a, I was a private. Yeah, I, I can imagine. I like Marines, but I don't like you. <laughs> you know. But he was a pain in the ass, and my, my, uh, my boss there at the, at the compound we were in, he goes, Matt, see if you shouldn't talk. That's the boss, man. You shouldn't talk to him that way. He'll fire you. Fuck him. <laughs> I don't care if he fires me. You know? I tell us somebody to come on down and follow my footprints. Do we have uh, questions for Herschel? He wouldn't, he wouldn't get off the property. He'd be panting in 138 degrees, 139 degrees. All he'd do is sweat. That'd help him lose weight. Let me. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm an asshole. I can be an asshole. I really can. But when you're an asshole, I'm an asshole. And I'm a really good asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Had a lot of training. When you get around assholes, you start taking their traits. Well, boy, I'm going to capture that because if I might, that might be might useful need it. sometimes. Uh, do you want to read you, off but you, you know, you've been through the same thing. If you were in the Rangers, you've been through the same shit I've been through. You may have not been on the same type ops, but you you know what I'm talking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you got to be a dick sometimes. Everything, everything in the military boils down to leadership. And look at the shit we got now in D.C., in charge of the military. Some of the sorriest son of a bitches you've ever seen in your life. They fired 200 of the best damn military leaders, officers and stuff that existed, as far as I'm concerned. I'm sure. very, you I'm, know, I'm, military and politicians do not mix. Yeah, I'm going to hit you up. You're on, we, you're uh, on the Republican side that are, are pulling the mark. And half of them are rhinos. And they vote with the Democrats. There's only one good Democrat. That party should go away. There are a lot of them are Marxists, and there's only one good one. That's Machen from West Virginia. He's a Democrat, but I like him. I like him. And he's left the party and started trying to start a, th a third party. Herschel, good uh, we have some uh, viewer questions for you that we want to get to. Can you tell me who's asking? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, so sort of. Uh, we can tell you what they what their username is. Um, so our first question is from Pug. Uh, thank you very much. Mustache origin story, please. Oh, my mustache? <laughs> 47 years old. Probably older than he is. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I was the only man in the neighborhood with a handlebar mustache. And I was very proud of that. Not egotistically, but I always wanted a handlebar mustache and when we were doing some things uh, where we had to grow beards and this and that and the other thing, I'd, I'd just grow this big mustache way, way long time ago, 1976. And uh, I got on a cruise after I was at Team 12. I was riding an LSD. They had a BLT aboard, Battalion Landing Team of Marines. And uh, one of the crew came and said, Master Chief, the XO would like to see you. Thank you. I'll tell. Go up and see. I went up, saw him, locked my heels in front of his desk. 
shave that mustache off. It's not regulation. I said, no, sir, I can't do that. What? I had a piece of paper from the Admiral. I said, this is from Admiral Lemoyne. He has requested I grow that mustache and I keep it. He even told me if anybody ever tells me to shave it off, have him call me. And there's his number. Put your paper away. I'm not calling nobody. I guess you're going to keep your mustache. <laughs> somehow, I, somehow I knew that. How, but I was nice. You... I was respectful. I was respectful, but, you know, he was a little bit of an asshole. Shave that mustache off. Well, you should ask the question first. <laughs> How did you get Admiral Lemoyne to write you papers for a handlebar mustache? How do I? Well, <laughs> I was a good seal. That's all I think I can tell you. I was a good seal. And I worked for him, and he liked me, and I damn sure liked him. And he has passed away, too. Oh, I, uh, I went to visit him as he was dying. Done a lot of that. Not happy. Probably can't do it very well anymore. I, I got a little emotional with him. I, uh, real men cry too. I get yeah. it. Yeah. That's for sure. Um, Robert Vall, and thank he, you very much. Did you ever get to work with the Navy's HAL uh, 3 Seawolves Huey gunships in Vietnam? Oh, yeah, yeah. The HAL uh, 5 boys. I was a recruiter in Utah. I was zone supervisor. I was a top recruiter in Hawaii, taking shore duty. Finally, I had to take a tour of show duty. Wasn't no wars going on, and my skipper called me in. I was one of, God, we had a ton of chiefs. Everybody in the damn team was a chief. He said, the Navy is coming after my chiefs. You're going to have to go to the fleet, Master Chief, unless you can find something to do for a couple of years. All I, my wife didn't want me to go to shore duty because I'm always gone. So I'll get the hell out. So I went short in, went to, I went armed forces courier. I tried that for a year, but, uh, that wasn't making my ducky quack. So I went into recruiting and I recruited in Hawaii and I recruited damn good because they were always calling me. Can you help us out? We're short of you got some. Yeah. That's for our zone. And I had, uh, a good chief recruiter and uh, I had a good uh, zone supervisor and uh, did very well. As a matter of fact, they fired a lot of the recruiters there and every time they'd fire one, I'd ask for his area. So I had all the islands and half of Oahu. I didn't have Kauai. And I put a lot of people in the United States Navy and I was the only recruiter that flew his own airplane. I had a Cessna 172. I rented. The Navy paid for it. And I did flew. I didn't use commercial air. I flew to all the outer islands myself and <laughs> recruited. And had cars there, so I made E9. So I made E9. <laughs> um, Blackwater Z 2010, thank you very much. Did you ever hear about the U.S. Marine conducting black ops on the oh god uh, yeah yeah absolutely dire, dire I, mean, I love the i got more jarhead buddies that keep up with me than i do seals i really do and a lot of seals keep up with me but i have the utmost respect for the marine corps i do them boys if it's if they're not taking 40 percent casualties they don't even want to go <laughs> you know i'm saying hell if i get a hang now we ought to stay here till we get fixed yeah but uh that was a good bunch. And the jarheads, if uh, if these bastards in D.C. screw everything up and we have to go to war here, Marine Corps will go 100%. So I I like that. Um, They're tough how, boys. Uh, M. Corbin, thank you very much. How much more effective was the pr suppressive fire from the Stoner 63 versus the chopped RPD 44s? Now, say that again. Uh, so he's asking between the Stoner 63 and the chopped RPD 44s, uh, how was was it was the suppressive fire better from a Stoner? Are you talking about Frogman and 44 and Frogman and 63? 
No, he's. Uh, the I RPD. think he's talking about Nam. Yeah. That that you guys had the chop down RPD machine guns. The the oh indige. yeah, well the the UDTs were over there too, and a lot of times they'd tag want to tag along, or they'd be going somewhere to do something. They did a lot of demo work. We would go in, hose the boys, and then have bunkers and stuff. The UDTs would come in and blow them all up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you know, as far as being operational and taking ops, they weren't doing that that I'm aware of. But they, they, you know, there was a UDT team around, you know, and, well, you know, they, we were always coordinating with them. I mean, it's the same guys. They're, they're, our, they're, they're the same people as we are. We just happen to be in the SEAL team. They happen to be in UDT. We have a different mission. What, so, did, what did you think of, you know, obviously you guys had the stoners and, and uh, like, the M16s and, and the, uh, you know, the, the carbines. And, what did you think about the difference between, like, the U.S. NATO weapons versus, like, the RPDs, the RPKs, the AKs. Did you ever like the the, the Soviet style weapons for anything? I gave a lot of them away. I had, I'm an American. I like American shit, buddy. <laughs> I do. I shoot a 45. I carried a Stoner and M60, and uh, you know I got a Winchester Model 70 pre-war down there under the bed. I got a 45 70. I got a ton of stuff, and all American. I'm an American. I don't need anything from the foreigners. They don't have anything better than what we got. 45. God's caliber. The AK AK is an excellent weapon. Excellent. But I I didn't want to carry it. A lot of the guys did. But I I didn't want to carry it. I carried my shit. American stuff. That's what it's for. And some up there, the stoner was very temperamental, but I'm a gun guy. So I didn't mind, because when that baby started talking, oh, God, dang, yes, you start <laughs> um, dancing. There, I just saw uh, something come up from uh, somebody named Hunter Hayes saying, Good evening, Herschel. My father worked under you as a contractor in Iraq. I attended the, Cit- the Citadel Military College of South Carolina, and I was wondering if you would be interested in speaking to the SC, uh, SECOC. I give talks all the time. Be glad to. Just let me know what the topic you want. That's all it takes. And, uh, of course, i got to be able to get, it's got to fit into my schedule so I can get there. But, yeah, I, I give talks all the time. I'm flattered when they want me to come give a talk. So, Hunter, flattered. you can reach out to us through our email uh, and then sure. or, or whatever, and then we'll pass it on uh, to Herschel. And then, John Pierre, thank you very much. Herschel, what do you think of all these naval assets getting blown up by the Ukrainians? Are these ships more vulnerable than they're made out to be? The Ukrainians are, what are they doing? I, I think he's talking about the Russian ships the Russian in the Black ships. Sea that yeah, keep the, getting yeah. blown up. It, it, well, it, you know, Ukraine is former, former Soviet satellite. And they're all corrupt. And here are these idiots we have in D.C. sending them tons of money and taking it away. We need to be helping the people here in America. So, you know, they've destroyed us. Look at it. We're, we're like a third world country now. They're certainly getting there. And all these damn wogs are coming in over the damn southern border from everywhere. Ten million now. And that's what their idea is. They're going to give them all the green cards so they'll vote democratically. And then the Republican Party will go away. You know, I mean, they must think we're brain dead, but a lot of people are brain dead that vote for these kind of bastards. They must not read. They don't study. They don't even know what's going on. Well, I've always been a Democrat. I had a guy tell me that down to junk when I throw him a try to it. Well, I've always been a Democrat. Well, I was raised a Democrat till my brain developed, and I haven't been one since. Yeah. Do you, do you think that yeah. the... Uh, Does that answer the, your question? Well, the, uh, do you think that the... Like, are the, the hits on, like, Russian ships, is that, like, a typical, uh, like, maritime or SEAL-style mission? Would the SEALs ever... Not that... I'm not, I'm not asking if the SEALs did this, because obviously it's Ukraine, Ukrainians, but, but is that a frogman mission to sort of hit ships while they're at port or in, like, low, low tides, things like that? Yeah, I guess so I make sure I understand what's talking about. We deploy on ships, but our... But, but would you, you know, ever, like, use, like, limpid lines? 
Well, like, go and destroy enemy ships. Yeah, would you ever, like, you know, use, like, rebreathers? Oh, and lipid yeah, lemmers, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Zulu One Oscar is what it's called. That's a swimmer attack. You know, we use our uh, our Drager breathing device, that German uh, rebreather where we don't give off bubbles and stuff. You can't go below 25 feet, and you can't overswim it or you're going to convulsions, but... You, uh, yeah, limit mines and stuff. Yeah, that's part of, I, I'm, I apologize. That's a UDT mission. It yeah. was, now it's SEAL mission. D, Is do, that what uh, you want to know? Do we have any other questions, Dave? I got the ones oh, from Patreon. Oh, you got yeah. all of them? Okay. Yeah. So. Um, and somebody just asked, uh, did you ever step on a mine in Vietnam? And if so, Yeah, that was uh, the 18th September, <laughs> 1969. I still have a bad back from that. Yeah, I took a ride. I was I was very lucky. I was very lucky. I was the thirteenth man in the patrol, and I stepped on that son bitch. And when it clicked, I knew exactly what I'd done. I can still remember the pressure, the detonator, the det, the initiator, the detonation, the pressure on my foot, my ankle jam, my knee jam, my hip jam, and I started airborne. It knocked me about. Uh, Somewhere between 10 and 15 feet in the air. Holy shit. And uh, it was a good one. And all the frag went to the right. Oh, wow. And my guardian angel knocked me to the left. Wow. <laughs> did, That's insane. Did they give you a mustard stain? Did you get a combat jump for that? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I got two purple hearts. That was my second one. But one little piece out of that damn booby trap, I think it was just old. You know, mm. I've probably been there for a while. Yeah. And uh, 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 it was 13 didn't people fully detonate. On. Got a bit fully detonated. It had blown my leg off. Yeah. But uh, one little piece punched through my boot and went right through the edge of my foot. Oof. I bled about, shit, three, four drops of blood maybe or more. And uh, that was it. Wow. And I walked out. They were going to call the helo to get me out. I said, I ain't, go I ain't going nowhere. They ain't taking me to no hospital. I'm walking out of here. That that's literally a, that okay, that is then. the real life. I don't. I ain't got time to bleed. Yeah. Now, right. <laughs> From predator. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I wasn't. I didn't want to go to no hospitals anymore. Yeah. Shit. Whether I'm the only one that's wanting to leave or not, I it just don't matter. Somebody's got to want to. Herschel. Uh, Man, I really appreciate you spending your Friday evening with us and telling us about your life and your stories. Um, is there anything through this whole interview like I failed to ask or that you really want to talk about, think, something that you're really passionate about? No, I'm passionate about everything. I know you are. I really am. I know you are. But is there, is there anything about your history that, I, that you'd really like to bring up that I didn't ask about? Well, there's probably a lot, but I can't think of it. You know, you, when you've done so much yeah, I know, for so I know long. You yeah. It, you know, and when people ask me certain things or they trigger me with a word or something, oh, God, yeah, I remember that. You know, but I've, I've been all over the world, everywhere. The only two places I haven't been is India and Russia. I've been to China. And I don't want to go there. I have no need to go there. India is the most populated place in the world. And it's too crowded. You can't move around very good. God, dead people laying around everywhere. I mean, good God. <laughs> you know, it's so Herschel it's that, uh, for for our our, for our younger listeners who may seek to emulate you someday. Uh, can you give us some solid handlebar mustache care tips? Wax. Is there tips. a wax or yeah, a conditioner yeah. that you use? Is it like I've, no? I I blow dry mine. Blow dry. It, 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 you know, yeah, if I'm going somewhere, I'll blow. But I use a little wax, yeah. If I'm going to be at an area for a while, because it'll droop down a little bit, and I, you, I have some mustache wax, and I'll just tighten up the ends, and that'll hold everything. Because mm -hmm. usually the ends is what falls out. Mm -hmm. So I just uh, use a little bit of that. But when I'm around here, I, I'll blow dry it a couple times a day with hot water. I'll comb it down with hot water, get it all soaked. Then I'll curl it with a uh, with a comb and blow dry. Is, is and there is is there a wax that you recommend? No, hell, I wouldn't know one from another. 
You well, know, hell, I'd use duck butter if that's all I can get. <laughs> I mean, because we're always teasing seals about their hair care regimen, and so I feel as though, like, if there's a product that you have that you like that we should, you know, pay tribute no, to. No, I, uh, you know, I, if, if you want to hang on, but I don't think it's necessary, I can go down and <laughs> no, dig no, it it's out okay. of my, it's okay. my um, goose gift. But Herschel, uh, you mentioned that you're, you're still doing some uh, marksmanship instruction. Is there anything that you want to promote that you want to tell people about classes that they can sign up for or, or anything, any, anywhere you want to tell people to go take a look at? Go to Gunsight or come to me, you know, whatever they want to do. And if they can get one-on-one, -on -one, a weekend is like a week's of training. Hey, uh, I, I cover a whole week and come to my place, stay right here with me. Uh, we uh, we'll do all the table talk stuff and all that kit getting rigged and all the the right things. But if you're going to have a gun, you got to learn to shoot. I don't care where you go to do it. Yeah. Gun site would be a best place, but that's going to be very dear, very expensive with lodging and all that sort of thing. But that's where I learned. And I, that's where I taught for seven years and that's an outstanding place. As a matter of fact, the director there now is an old buddy of mine that I trained a long time ago, police officer. I think he was a chief in uh, Indianapolis area, and uh, he, Campbell is his last name, and he's uh, he runs the show there now. Always want me to come, but I uh, I just got other eggs to fly, uh, yeah. eggs to fry. Do Do you have Do you have like if people wanted to come train with you? Do you have a website up or? How, how do people find you to do that? Oh, and, you know, I'm tactical weapons and gun, uh, tactical weapons and uh, weapons and tactics is my uh, my company, and uh, North American weapons and tactics. And uh, there's really, yeah, you maybe you can find it on the internet and stuff, but I don't pursue that activity like I used to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I still teach. I got doctors I train. I, I helped start a, a, guy, a place called The Site in Illinois. I bought the land for a very wealthy guy. He, he just used it as a personal training area. But I ran schools out of there and all that stuff. And a former SEAL uh, sniper from uh, Team One, retired, runs it now for the, the owner. And uh, I go out and teach a couple classes there, short ones, a couple days, because I've been training these guys a long time, but they want to get trained every year and get back up to speed. And uh, that's about all I do. And then I work at the police academy. So that's it. Uh, and and that's a, very, very, two weeks, tw three times a year. For our, uh, our listeners out there, uh, next, uh, actually on Monday, we're going to be back with Jonah Mendez. She was a disguise officer at the CIA, um, has a, a new uh, memoir out. So we'll be back on, mon at, on uh, Monday with her. Um, and I'd also take a, two seconds to plug our Patreon. Please check it out if you haven't. Uh, you get access to all of these episodes ad-free, and we really appreciate you supporting the channel. And Herschel was he was he was he part of War uh, Snowcap? Uh, who? Jo uh, Joanna. Jo hey. Jonah? No, Jonah. I, I don't think Jonah wa yeah. uh, was ever with Snowcap. I, I could be mistaken, though. I mean, I don't know her whole biography. Yeah, well, I read White stuff, and uh, that boy was a go-getter. I'm not real sure about the agency anymore. The government has uh, weaponized that against uh, conservatives. I'm a, you know, I'm a Catholic. I'm a terrorist. I'm a Christian. <laughs> Christians are terrorists now. Are you a Christian? You're a terrorist. That's what they're putting the word out now. You know, over half the people in America now do not believe in God. Where in the hell did that come from? I read that. I mean, that's published. Well, you're also that's a veteran, strange. which which also makes you, according to like the FBI, more susceptible to extremism. So. Well, you know, yeah, I'm an extremist because I care about my country. It's called patriotism where I sit. They call it extremism because they're damn sure not patriots. And ain't none of them ever been in harm's way unless they bumped into a hydrant or something <laughs> with a car. Yeah, you know, I got no time for the cowardly sons of bitches. And they are. And everybody keeps saying, man, see, if you've got to calm down, they're going to come get you. Come on. 
<laughs> 83 years old? Come on. Better bring some good boys with you. Herschel, thank you so much for doing this interview with us tonight, and uh, thanks for well, bearing I with us. It, it's been I a lot of fun. It's been helpful. It, it has. It's been amazing, yeah. and we deeply appreciate it. And we'd love to have you yeah. on again sometime, um, you know, because we know that we covered the surface like yeah. barely scratched the surface with with your career and 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 everything like that i was a blessed man i was i've been very lucky and i'm blessed but hey if you're in new york if you ever come down in the outer banks area you call me you got a place to stay you'll pay four thousand five thousand a week on the outer banks at my place on the island you'll be free we'll have a drink i got a lot of scotch I don't have no Jap stuff. But, I'll be there. You know, I got, I got good stuff. <laughs> Sounds perfect. I'll give you a call when I'm coming through town for sure, Herschel. <laughs> yeah, bring your buddy too. Yeah, yeah, we'll have a good time. We'll go have some she crab soup, talk dirty. Hell yeah. Sounds perfect. <laughs> all right, guys. Uh, we'll see all of you on Monday. Thank you again, Herschel. Uh, we'll see everyone then.